Good morning. Praise the Lord today. We have quite a bit to be thankful for as we reflect on at this time of year. But you know, life is not without its difficulty. I think all of us would agree uh, when you examine the, especially if you've recently been through one, periods of testing in your life that we go through some hard stuff. You know, and each one to his own, uh, sometimes I look at the stuff that I feel like is going to break me and I think, well, this is nothing compared to someone in a third world country that may lose their life for their faith. But, but we are tested. You know, we are put through a crucible that's specifically calculated for us, for our benefit, for our growth. And when we go through those times, we have two options. Either we will remain thankful or we'll become bitter. And it's far more natural to become bitter when things are hard. It's much, much more difficult to choose to remain thankful. And I, I still remember the first time I heard Michael really make that point that you have to fight to stay thankful on how important that was. And since then, it's just, it's become such a necessary tool for me to, to succeed, to make it through when when I'm pressed, when I'm tested and, and proven. And I'd like to start in Psalm chapter 119. You know, when you're looking at your option of being thankful or becoming bitter, being discontent, it's it boils down to a matter of your perspective and what you choose to do. Proper perspective is everything and it's going to determine the outcome. We, we will not have a good outcome in any trial or in this life as a whole if our perspective is skewed. If you remain fixed and focused on the pain or on how it may not seem fair or how hard it is, you're going to do badly with it. But if you can choose to keep your perspective focused on the Lord and on how He is near, even if you don't feel it, on how He is good, just because we know Him. It may not always seem like He's doing a good thing, but, but we know we can count on Him. We know He's proven Himself and that what He does is good. You know, when David, he always knew that. We'll look at 119, we'll be in verse 107. Something that I, I, I just love in the Psalms, I love about David, is that he never shies away from telling the Lord how hard it is, from telling the Lord how much pain he's in. He, he, he doesn't make any qualms about that, but he voices that passionately, and then he always chooses to remember the Lord and to praise Him and to thank Him for what He has done, despite how difficult it feels right now. In verse 107 and 108, he says, I am exceedingly afflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. And I will accept the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. See, it's okay for us to say I'm exceedingly afflicted. It's okay to say this feels too hard. But what we choose to do from that point forward is what's going to determine if it's a success or a failure, if it breaks us or if it builds us, is that do we choose to offer 
free will offerings of praise. And it was Sarah that was reading this this week, and she came across this verse and felt moved to look it up. And the word free will offerings translated basically means voluntary praise. So it's not that we're, we're demanded to have a praise service in that moment. It's an opportunity for us to volunteer thanksgiving and volunteer praise to the Lord, which is far more precious in, in those times than it is when everything makes you feel happy. When you feel everything's going your way and you're on a mountaintop, it's good to praise the Lord. But how much more precious to Him and a witness to others? You know, uh, we were kind of having some back and forth discussion over this sort of thing with Sarah and I and, and Jen this week. And Jen said something and I, uh, I quoted it because I really liked the way it, it, it went. It says, maintaining gratefulness instead of surrendering to bitterness is not easy, but it's such a blessing. And what comes out of you when you are oppressed is so precious to the Lord and it ministers to the rest of us. You know, that's the beauty of being in a high pressure situation is we are pressed and the Lord needs to see what's going to flow out of us. Will, will the devil be able to extract bitterness from us and to blame the Lord or just lose some trust in him or just complain too much? Or will we be pressed in this, this thankfulness just for who God is? Like, and there's always something we can find to be thankful for, if nothing else, but that he's He's made us and given us life and promised that we will be redeemed at the end of it. Promised that we will have eternal life with him. And beyond that, there's always something else you can be thankful for. You know, we, you talk to a lot of quote-unquote Christians these days, and there's this bare minimum mindset so many people have. I don't know how many times, I'm sure you all can relate, you talk with someone that, well, is it really a salvational issue if I eat this clean or unclean food or, or whatever the topic is, something they want to be able to get away with, that's so far of, removed from the mindset that we should have when it comes to our relationship with our Father is that we want to please Him so much so that even when everything hurts, we can choose to remain thankful to Him for how faithful He's, he's already been. I mean, when you look at someone like Joseph and everything that he went through, or Job. I mean, I've, I've read through their accounts before and wondered, I don't think that I could have as positive uh, an uh, attitude as they maintained. I, don't, I think most people put under those sorts of pressures would fail. I think most people in Job's circumstances would have cursed God. I think, I mean, how many people can remain as faithful as Joseph when every time he's faithful, it goes wrong for him? Every time he's faithful, it seems as if he's punished. And it's not recorded for us in Joseph's uh, account, but I would be willing to guarantee every day he woke up and he just thanked God that he was alive that day. He thanked God that he was near and that he loved him and that he was promised redemption despite what everything looked like around him. I just know that he did. I, know, I, don't, I don't think you can succeed without doing that. I don't think Job can say... I know my Redeemer lives, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. I mean, see, that's what he's clinging to, is that he knows God is good, and he's thankful that he's redeemed. He doesn't see it. I mean, everything seems awful right now, but he's thankful. That's the title of the message today, is Always Thankful. Turn uh, to Acts chapter 16. We'll read in verse 25. We don't have time to go through the whole account, but you know that Paul and uh, I believe it's Silas here are, you know, they're just preaching the gospel in the city. The Lord's called them to. They're doing what they're told. And uh, they cast the spirit out of a woman, and the next thing you know, they're beaten. And I can only imagine how badly it hurts and how miserable it is to be beaten with rods by multiple people. Who knows how long that goes on? And then you're thrown into a cold prison in the middle of the prison and you know I don't think it would have necessarily been wrong to just do what God called you to do and then you end up in this circumstance and to grit your teeth and just kind of bear it you know as I'm sure many of us have had to do that 
through different circumstances. And I don't think it would be wrong to just grit your teeth and deal with it. But in verse 25, they, you go further than that. And it says, But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. I mean, they were singing hymns of praise. And you know, I used to hear that taught on and spoken about, and I would just kind of assume that they were really happy. But I don't think they are. Like, happiness doesn't necessarily accompany this type of thing. Usually it doesn't. Usually it's just an act of your will. Say, I will decide to be thankful. I will decide to praise the Lord because he's worthy of it. And so I'm going to find something to be thankful for, and I'm going to worship him despite everything that's going on around me. And as a kid, I can remember thinking that I've known people like this and reading this story and others like it, that there's this personality trait that some people have that just makes them ridiculously happy all the time, and they can smile when things are going badly, but, you know, that's not what it is. It's not that. It's just a matter of deciding. I'm going to stay thankful because I know the Lord. I know that He is good, and I will thank Him for everything I can think to thank Him for. You know, it's easy when it's great, but when it's really hard is when it really counts and it blesses Him, and then it's such a witness and an inspiration to the rest of us. I mean, how many times do we draw on Job or Joseph or Paul's example of what they went through and the attitude they maintained throughout? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Chapter 5 at the end in verse 18 says, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And to be completely honest, many times in the past I've heard that taught, I've read it, and I've just thought, that's an unreasonable request. It's not, that's not normal to, and I used to think that it meant give thanks for everything, but really when you look it up, it, it basically means in every circumstance remain thankful. No matter where you find yourself, no matter what you're going through, Remain thankful. Give thanks. And I just used to think that that's just not possible. You know, I mean, you can ask me to bear something difficult and maybe I can make it through it, but you can't make me be happy about it. But again, we don't have to be happy about it. You know, we can be thankful for the trial and what the Lord accomplishes through it. And then beyond that, we can just be thankful that He is near. You know, when you look up the word give thanks, and what it's translated from in verse 18 there. Um, we're going to get a little wordy, a little studious here, but I think this is, is really precious. And forgive my uh, pronunciation, I probably won't get it all right, but give thanks is from the word eucharistio, which the word eu, E-U, means good, and then the root uh, charis means grace. And so literally, give thanks means to be thankful for God's grace. And so even if physically, circumstance-wise, it doesn't seem like there's much to be thankful for. If you can't think of anything else, we can be thankful that we're in the Lord's grace. We can be thankful that He's favorably disposed towards us, that we have His favor. And going beyond that, all this ties in. Uh, turn over to Philippians chapter 4. Chapter 4, and we'll read verse 4 through 8. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And again, to be honest, I've read that in times of testing for myself, and I've just thought, I don't know how to be happy and be joyful right now. But we're going to look at that word in a little bit greater depth here. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. And be anxious for nothing but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. See, we're commanded to find the things that we can be thankful for, to find the things that are worthy to be dwelling on. That's our perspective. That's what we're viewing instead of the circumstance. And then you go and you look up the word rejoice and 
thanksgiving from verse 4 and then verse 6 where it's with supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to God it's the same thanksgiving as that we read in 1 Thessalonians 5 from that word uh, charis meaning uh, to be thankful for God's good grace and the word rejoice is from the exact same root if you look at the words it's x-a-i-r-o instead of x-a-r-i-s so it's Cairo which means favorably disposed leaning towards it's the same as in x-a-r-i-s with charis which is grace to delight in God's grace, literally to experience God's favor and be glad for his grace. It has a direct etymological connection with charis or grace and kara, which is joy and rejoice. And they all share the same root and therefore the same fundamental meaning. So whether it's give thanks, have thanksgiving, rejoice, they mean grace. They mean be thankful for God's good grace. And then when you look up the word grace, I wanted to know more about where that one comes from. It's the same root, X-A-R-I-S, charis, which means favor, disposed to, inclined towards or favorable towards, leaning towards to share benefit. And it's preeminently used of the Lord's favor, which means he's freely extended to give himself away to people because he's always leaning towards them. So God's grace is his favorable disposition towards us. It's him leaning towards us. And isn't that what he's always done? He's always, always been inclined towards us, giving of himself from the moment of inception where he chose that he wanted to create us because he wanted to share his love. And he created the universe with the purpose of blessing us, of giving us dominion over it and giving us pleasures to enjoy He did all that knowing that leaning forward we would slap him in the face, that we would reject him, we would side with his enemy, and then still he was willing to remain leaning forward to experience that hurt and to come and suffer so that he could bestow his grace upon us so that he could redeem us. And at the end, you know, we we get to enjoy eternity with him and everything in between. I just thought that was so beautiful what grace means, that it's him leaning towards us and And then we're called to be thankful for that in every circumstance and to lean back towards him. Like it's the same root in the words, to lean towards him. And something happened uh, several days ago that I thought illustrated this really beautifully. Um, I went to change a lease for like the 20th time um, that evening. And I put it on the changing table and I turn around for two seconds to grab a diaper and then I hear a thud. And I turned back around and she's kicked her foot, I think her heel, on the side of this changing table and her face changes and she just goes code red and like lips quivering and she's screaming and devoted protective Sarah comes rushing in to see what I've done to her, you know, and uh, scoops her up and I'm like, I think she just kicked her foot, wasn't me, you know, and, but Elise didn't turn away from her parents. And, and blame us for allowing her to get hurt. She didn't do that. She, you know, Sarah leaned towards her and scooped her up and then Elise just leaned into her and she was comforted in her and she knew that she's good. She knows that she's her mommy and she loves her and, and she's thankful for that. And I have this photo, if you wanna see it, of her just clutching Sarah's shirt, like she was just holding on to her. And you know, that's what we're called to do when when we're being pressed, when when we're experiencing pain, is to lean back towards the Lord to remember that we can always be thankful He's leaning towards us, that we can always be thankful for His grace to just know that we're redeemed. And we'll close in Psalm 107. Just the first couple of verses. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary and gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Hallelujah.
wanted to begin today with a, a testimony, which is the what kind of prompted the <clears throat> theme of my message today, which is many are called. Um, this is really brought to the forefront of my mind this week um, because of an experience that Sandy and I had with Macromedia. Um, we got, we were contacted by a representative from the Russellville City Mall to do a couple of commercials for them. And so we went and met with this woman and um, in the course of talking to her about what they wanted to do, it was brought up a couple of times kind of in passing how they might want to do like a Christmas theme type commercial. And so Sandy and I just kind of listened and, and we, that's not something that we had really talked about. Uh, you know, we weren't really fully operating this time last year, so it's not something we had run into yet. So we went to lunch right after meeting with her and then we talked to Michael and a couple other people just to kind of get their input on it. And, um, and of course we knew uh, pretty quickly what we were gonna do and not do. You know, it was pretty, it was pretty plain early on. Um, so I, I was trying to figure out how to tell this woman uh, that, you know, that we just met with for an hour that, yeah, we're not going to be able to do that after all, sorry, type thing. You know, it felt bad, but I knew that's what we had to do. So I wrote out a pretty detailed but succinct message to her just telling her why. It was, it was pretty plain um, why we wouldn't be doing that. And, um, and we, of course, fully expected her to not like that very much and just be like, well, I tell you what, guys, you can just go on somewhere else. That's kind of what I expected from her. Um, but when she wrote back, it was more uh, inquisitive than anything else. She genuinely wanted to know why we believed the way that we believed. And it kind of went back and forth for probably up to an hour or so. And which was a real surprise to me. Um, and when it all came down to it, they opted to shoot the commercials, but just do them a year round ad and not do the, the Christmas part at all. Um, and I, I sent a screenshot of uh, our message back and forth to our sibling Facebook message that we have. Um, and Sarah mentioned that she had had a conversation with this, this woman years and years ago, the same conversation with the same person. And kind of the chances that that it would be me, you know, and Sandy who are talking to her from the same family and the same church, you know, is just kind of uncanny. Um, and so, you know, she, like I said, she opted to go ahead and have us do those commercials with her in a different way. So Sandy and I went and met with her a couple times. I think I, I went another time uh, after Sandy just alone. And we had wonderful fellowship, you know, us and, and this woman did. And she ended up, while we were there, after we shot, telling us her testimony. Sandy shared part of his testimony with her, so it kind of ended uh, in a very different way than I thought. And I, you know, it was exactly the opposite of what I thought would happen. I didn't think when I was talking to her that we would see her again, but it kind of went the exact opposite way. Um, and it just kind of brought to mind through all that, through that week, you know, how, how, God, how God calls people and how he shines light in dark corners in ways that we don't really understand sometimes. Um, and I don't, of course, know what will happen with all of that or with her, um, but I can't help but believe that God orchestrated that, at least in part, for us to talk to her and for it to go the way that it did and, and for us to have an opportunity to, to have that small witness with her um, you can turn to Matthew chapter 22. And we'll begin in verse 1. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent others saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. 
But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there was a man with no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For, the, for many are called, but few are chosen. And the part of that I kind of wanted to look at was, you know, reading it last night, it kind of st stuck out to me that five minutes before th those people were invited, they didn't know they were going to be invited. They didn't get an invitation in the mail. It wasn't something that they had uh, planned out in their planner. This was just, this was what the king decided in that moment is what he wanted. So, you know, we, we never know, you know, when we're going to kind of get that invitation. And we never know as, you know, as the saints, when we're going to have that invitation opportunity to be an instrument that God uses, maybe to call someone else or to be a witness to someone else. Um, turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 1. Begin in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's, and the virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth is in her old age and also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be, will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And again, <laughs> Mary didn't have any idea moments before that the angel of the Lord was going to approach her and ask her to do that incredibly heavy thing that, you know, you, you, of the accounts in the Bible, there are very, very few, if any, that have anywhere near that magnitude, you know, and that was thrust upon this, this young woman. Um, and I'm, I doubt that was something that had ever even begun to cross her mind, but, but she answered that call when it came. And because of that, we obviously, we see what happened because of her faithfulness to answer that call with that giant <laughs> call there. Um, turn over to Acts chapter 9. Begin in verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. 
The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of, God, children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. So not only, of course, was Paul called in that, but Ananias was called upon to do something that was heavy too. And of course, he, he said as much to the Lord, you know, reminding him of the authority that, that Paul had and the reputation that he had. Um, but how many would not be saved today if not for Ananias being faithful and doing what the Lord asked him to do, answering his call so that Paul could answer his call and how it goes over and over and over again and repeats itself because of the faithfulness of one. And I think the, the point is that we don't know uh, in what way God will call someone or what he'll use to reach someone, even if it's something you know, small and seemingly insignificant. Um, you know, in our, in our case, that, that was, in the grand scheme of things, insignificant, an ins insignificant thing. Um, there wasn't a lot at, at stake on our end. We, you know, if we hadn't got that job, we would have lost out on a few hundred bucks or something like that. So it's, you know, looking at it that way, it's not a heavy thing. Like, like of course, the examples we just read uh, in our lives weren't at risk like many of these were. Um, but as small as that was, that was an opportunity for us, and we don't know what kind of in impact that may have down the line just for taking that small stand the way that we did. Um, and you just don't know what kind of reverberating effect that things like that will have. And we get those opportunities much more often than, than we realize, I think. Um, and I pray that we recognize them more and that we can answer that call when they come. Amen. Amen. Psalm 77. I cry out to God. Yes, I shout. Oh, that God would listen to me. When I was in deep trouble, I searched for the Lord. All night long I prayed with hands lifted towards heaven, but my soul was not comforted. I think of God and moan, overwhelmed with longing for his help. You don't let me sleep. I'm too distressed even to pray. I think of the good old days, long since ended, when my nights were filled with joyful songs. I search my soul and ponder the difference now. Has the Lord rejected me forever? Will he never again be kind to me? Is his unfailing love gone forever? Have his promises permanently failed? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he slammed the door on compassion? And I said, this is my fate. The Most High has turned his hand against me. But then I called all of you, all you have done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. Oh God, your ways are holy. Is there any God as mighty as you? You are the God of great wonders. You demonstrate your awesome power among the nations. By your strong arm, you redeem your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. When the 
Red Sea saw you, O God, its waters looked and trembled. The sea quaked to its very depths. The clouds poured down rain, the thunder rumbled in the sky. Your arrows of lightning flashed, your thunder roared from the whirlwind, the lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your road led through the sea, the pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway no one knew was there. You led your people along the road like a flock of sheep with Moses and Aaron as their shepherds.
number 15.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Happy Sabbath to everybody. Happy Sabbath to all of you who are watching. Welcome today. And those who are watching from our congregation who are not here today, happy Sabbath and receive warm greetings from your brethren here in Russellville. If you have any prayer requests uh, you'd like us to offer up with, with our incense, write it down, hold it up, or bring it up, and we'll come and get it. Um, we do have special music today. Brian is going to sing 10,000 Reasons, and Shane is going to sing For the Lamb. Uh, we have any uh, prayer requests or any updates? No? No new prayer requests? No. Oh, John's sick? Yeah. Uh, cold or virus or something? I don't, I don't know what it is. Okay, well, uh, remember John in your prayers. Also, uh, Remember Mark uh, Garrick in Arlington, Texas, and for God to heal him. Also, uh, Melissa Doreen, uh, dear sister of ours, uh, has been uh, associated with us for many, many years, uh, has been having severe allergy, actually for uh, seven years now. And, uh, but it's, 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 it's gotten to the point to where now she's had to They've had to sell their home and, and uh, try to live in a more sterile environment, and she's really having a very difficult time. She sent me a picture of her, herself, and her face was swollen, and her tongue was swollen, and she's having difficulty breathing, and uh, it's just terrible. So remember Melissa in your prayers for God to bring about a great testimony for his glory. Amen. Uh, 
Okay, I don't think we have any other any announcements we need to make that we know of. Okay. Donnie, you could just stay here. You can pray over this, this prayer request. <laughs> any other prayer requests you want to put in this bowl? All right, well then, Donnie will pray over these uh, prayer requests, and then Brian will sing one, 10,000 uh, Reasons, and Shane will sing For the Lamb. Father in heaven, we come to you <clears throat> thankful, thankful for your, that we can come to you, bring our prayers to you, ask for your intervention, and we just pray for all these prayers and, and just pray that uh, you'll be glorified and you'll give an answer that glorifies. And we just give you thanks. In all the name of Jesus, amen.
worship His holy name. I sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore.
Back in the early 1950s, my mother met a man from Dover. Uh, his family owned a, a ranch there and, and a dairy farm. And uh, they began to date, fell in love with one another, as it goes in the world. And married. Joined the Navy, he joined the Navy. And so while he was stationed in Salinas, California, and of course that's where my mother was, and she was pregnant with me, and so I was born there in Salinas, California, because there was a, there was a naval base there. My dad was on an aircraft carrier, the USS Antietam. And, uh, you know, I have some pictures of uh, my dad and I when I was a baby, him holding me. Uh, Michael looks and walks and just his body posture is so much like my dad. Uh, it's like just looking at him, just the way he holds his uh, his arms, the way he uses his hands, uh, very familiar. Um, but one day, when I was a baby, and uh, suddenly my father disappeared. <clears throat> my mother didn't know what had happened, did not receive a note. Uh, there was no, nothing, no indication, no warning. Now, I'm, I'm talking, the only side I really know extensively was her side, and I know very little about that. She didn't talk about it, really. But he simply disappeared. She didn't know what had happened to him. He did not contact her. Uh, he just left us. He left me, and he left, uh, he left his son, and he left his wife. Now, we didn't, she didn't know what had happened. She didn't know but what maybe, you know, something bad had happened to him. But she began to look for him and just trace as much as she could. It's a whole lot easier today than it was then. And she found him in Oklahoma, married to another woman. And so my mother divorced him. And uh, as often happens, <clears throat> you know, when you walk away from God, for example, and many people walk away from God. They're not just walking away from God. They're walking away from God to something or someone else. And there's only two. There is the God of heaven, the God, our creation, who loves our soul, who created us for his glory and has wonderful plans for us. And then there's the God of this world, who is the devil, who hates us, who wants to destroy us, who will lie to us, will try to get us to think that he's on our side and that God is depriving us and that we deserve things. And it's only natural to desire these things of the world. But you know, the things of the world is what killed the first humans. They, the, the fruit from the forbidden tree killed the first humans. And it's us following their example ever since has caused death in the world. And so as people who they walk away from God, and God is love. So you're walking away from love. You're walking away from love to hate. You're walking away from good, perfect good, and love, the love of your soul, to the evil, to evil and the evil one who hates you and wants to destroy you. And that's the truth. And even in the natural, when people usually walk away from someone, some of you have had this happen, where you, you were married and, and your spouse walked away from you and ended up with somebody else because they don't just walk away, they walk away and to something else. Something that God does not ordain. Something that, that God would say, that the Holy Spirit would cry out in their conscience and testify to their heart, don't do this. Don't do this. And you know, every man knows that God exists. Every man in the world, every woman in the world, 
Every child in the world knows that there's a right and wrong. Everybody does. They may not understand exactly what right is right and what is wrong, but it, there's a law written in our hearts by which we know that there is a right and there is a wrong. And we, on purpose, when we want, we began to be enticed, our lust, the lust of our flesh begins to be enticed. To move us, it's not only to move us, see, when we, if we're married to someone and you move away from them in order to pursue someone else, that is leaving God's way. That's leaving God's love. God's love is not selfish. God's love is not, does not envy. God's love does not, uh, you know, seek its own interests. God's love does not put yourself first. Really, how, how evil is it to leave the wife of your youth and your children? She gave birth to your children. And you forsake that and walk away to someone else. People do that with God all the time. But that's, that's the way of the world. That's the way of Satan. That's, people have always done that. It plays out in our relationships, in our marriages, you see. Now, I have pictures of my dad and holding me when I was little. It looks like Michael. looks exactly like Michael holding Elise. Same body length, same posture, the same size person. And I don't have any pictures of my father with me beyond when he was holding me when I was a baby. And you know why? Because he wasn't there. Not only did he walk away from my mother and from me, he never contacted us. He never came back. He never visited. I never received a card. I never received a, a birthday gift or anything from him. And it caused a problem with me when I began to be an early teenager because my mother never kept it from me that, you know, the, the, the man in the home, her husband that was in the home was not my father, but was, a, was my stepfather. And incidentally, uh, he had a son who was being raised by another man from a failed marriage. You know, the only mother I knew, and I loved my mother, and I knew my mother loved me, but my mother was a bitter woman. She was hard and she was bitter, and I believe that she was bitter because of that. Now, you know, I was close to all of her three, well, all of her three brothers, very close. One of them was a mentor of mine. I'm still close to her other two sisters who are still alive. All the brothers are, are dead. But I was close to all of them. None of them were bitter. Only my mother. And she was bitter. And I, I think that she had been grieved so much. Her dreams had been shattered. Because someone walked away. Now, I'm not here to judge. There's always two sides to the story. And it could be that, you know, when my father went to Oklahoma and married uh, another woman, he had three daughters with her. Two of them are still alive, and they're, they're in regular contact with me, though we didn't grow up together. We, I didn't know them until they were teenagers. I didn't know them, actually, until the oldest one died. Well, actually, I didn't know them, really. I'd met them maybe once, but I didn't know them until... Uh, well, actually, until my father left their mother in the same way. Just suddenly, no note, no warning, nothing. Left his truck. Didn't even take his truck. Just found the empty truck. And he was gone. 
And that's when they called me. As if I would know. I had never seen him. He'd never come to see me. I don't tell them these things, and I hope they're not watching. They do watch these sermons, and I'm sorry. I don't want to, like I said, I don't want to judge, but it's just that that's what happened. No financial support and uh, no contact. Now, I do know that relatives on that side of the family, particularly my father's sister's husband, who was a police officer and a sheriff here in Arkansas. He was a detective. I love him. And, uh, but at my father's funeral, which I went to, he told me that he often spoke about that, about the situation and how he had left my mother and, and he had left me when I was a baby. And he had always told him that that was the worst mistake and the deepest regret that he ever had. And I, I hope that that's true. And I'm certainly not bitter. Uh, I mean, uh, when my, my half-sister, and I didn't know these girls, but uh, when she was 30 years old, I think she was 30, she died of a brain aneurysm suddenly in her sleep. She was in the Air Force, had a six-year-old child. And so I went to her funeral, and it was there that, you know, I, I had saw my father again. He had come back into their lives, and, and he had, again, when he left them, they found him in Texas with another woman. So, again, they adore him. They love him. They don't hold this against him. Uh, most people that have said anything to me about him have said that he's a wonderful person. And maybe in a lot of ways he is. Like I say, I'm not judging him at all. But those are the facts. Those are the facts. And whenever you seek your own interests, whenever you decide you're going to do what you want to do for yourself, and you forsake your responsibilities to others, there are consequences. And I know, you know, he regretted, according to, my, you know, my uncle's testimony on that side, that he regretted that, that he suffered consequences. But he did it twice, you see, walking away. And to me, that's like love spurned. Spurning someone's love, pushing someone. I mean, you are leaving your relationship, your contact with someone that you're supposed to love and cherish, that you made a vow to love and cherish. And when we are baptized, that's in a sense what we're doing. And you know, I've baptized you all, and you know uh, what I've asked you when I baptized you. If it costs you everything, are you willing to go through it all? Are you willing to go through the valley of the shadow of death? Are you willing to live in a cave like the great cloud of witnesses or be put in a log and sawn in two to be persecuted like the Apostle Paul, to be arrested, imprisoned? Are you willing to be alone in this world? Because there are those who are. But we're never alone. And we can find ourselves taking comfort in in people in the world that are not going to be there in the end. They're not going to be there. Uh, they're there for a whole different reason than Jesus is. Jesus said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. He's there, you know, because he truly loves you with an everlasting love. And we can't say that about any people that are going to be near us. Now, we're told as we have that godly love, if we don't quench it, we have that godly love for one another. But I think about how God must be grieved. My mother was grieved, you know, when my father left. It grieved her. Her dreams were shattered. 
It wasn't what she thought. And I don't know the circumstances of what brought it on. I don't know. You know, she may have played a part in it. Probably did. You know, there's usually two sides to every story. But the, but the facts are what they are. Uh, a broken marriage, a broken family, an abandoned child, you see. And that not only happened with me, he waited until the three girls in Oklahoma were teenagers. I think the youngest was 15 when he left. He left, and they had no idea where he was. He didn't leave a note, nothing. And they thought that he had been... Some, something bad had happened to him. They didn't know. They just came. They called me over and over, just distraught. And it was a strange situation for me because I didn't know him. I didn't know him. I would never talked to him. I didn't know him. But I could sympathize with him. But I had no idea where he was, why he left. I had no, or if something had happened to him, I had no idea. You know, there's two choices, really, that anyone has, people have. God created everyone for his glory. He has a purpose and he has plans for everybody. He loves us. But there's two choices. Either we're going to be with God are we going to be separate from God? Now, the fruits are there today. Amen? There are people who seek God, but there's not very many of us. There's not very many people that seek God, and then there are people who think they seek God, but really, they're seeking, they're trying to get something out of Him. They're trying to use Him as a formula to get something they want whether it be prosperity or divine health or whatever it happens to be, it comes back to self, amen? So they're not seeking the Lord according to his will, even though they would never admit that, or even maybe they don't even know it. Maybe they convince themselves, well, I know what God's will is, but it's more than what just comes back to us. It's what we also give to him, amen? What we offer up to him. I mean, listen, love not returned is tragic, isn't it? Think about it. Love not returned. He gives everything for us. And then there are so many, most people do nothing for him. Even though they may want to use him to get even more. He gives us life. He gives us uh, the beauty of this planet. He gives us pleasures. He gives us a palate that tastes wonderful food. He provides wonderful food. He, he provides, you know, so many pleasures in this, war, this, in, this in our life, in this world. Uh, and yet, you know, most people don't thank him for that at all. They take it for granted. They don't thank him. And they just pursue more. They, they pursue to to feed the lust of their flesh. And that's what they continue to pursue. And it's a bottomless pit. It will never be filled. And the devil knows that. And he knows that if he can get people there, they'll just continue to shovel in just whatever. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. And, and as, as Jesus said, it waxes colder. And it does. But there's only two choices. We're either going to be with God or not. And so those of us today, I mean, who's bearing what fruit? And what fruit are people bearing? If someone is, is, is seeking God, if someone is seeking to be near to God, seeking God's will, honestly, wanting to bring honor to God, want to obey Him, trusting Him, knowing that in obeying Him is in our interest too, that God you know, tells us. He doesn't ask, he doesn't deny anything good from us. He's giving only what is good to us. He's not withholding anything that is not good. If he withholds anything, it's only something that's just whitewashed or gift wrapped up and it's, it, will, it will hurt us or maybe even lead to our destruction. So we trust him. 
And so there are people, only a few, that are really seeking him, thanking him, appreciating him, giving him thanks and glorifying his holy name, thanking him for his grace, as Blake was saying. You see, giving testimony. You see, and want to love him by obeying him. And so we can't love God without obeying him. And then there are other people who don't seek him at all. Not really. Although they may put on a little facade of it in order to make themselves feel okay. To feel good. I want to tell you something. In all congregations, even those worldly congregations, you have people leave. There are people that come, just like the parable of the sower. I mean, some of them spring up, you know, go buy the biggest Bible they can get their arm on, <laughs> going around, they witness to everybody, and then they just flame out. And they don't, they, you know, they go straight back to the world. I've seen them, you've probably seen them. There's others that maybe they're a little slower, but, you know, persecution comes along or maybe the worries of the world and they just wear them down to where they just get weary and then they just leave. They may not even leave the congregation, but they leave God and they leave their love. They've lost their first love for God and for his people like Ephesus did. And then there's good soul. Now, you and I, we sow. That's what we do. We sow the seed like Matthew and Sandy did with the lady at the mall. We sow the seed. That's all we can do. We, you know, it's not like today where pe- there's a specific place where people will plant a seed and think that they dig a little hole and they'll put that seed in there. No, back then they just sowed it. They sowed the seed. It, it, was, it would just fall everywhere and land on the, on the, you know, they had a bag. They'd put their hand in there and they'd just sow it. The wind would blow it and And some of it would go by the roadside and the birds would come and eat it. That's what would happen, just like if you did it today. And some of it would be among uh, stony stony soil. Some of it would be around, uh, you're not trying to throw it on stony soil, but you don't know where, we don't always know where. Stones are sometimes under the soil. We don't always know where. Sometimes someone looks very stony and they have a very tender heart. We found that out, right? Just like Matthew. I mean, they, Matthew and Sandy expected a pushback, you know, from the lady at the mall when, when they told them that they would not do any kind of commercial about Christmas. But, but they didn't get that. But that's what they expected. They expected a stony <laughs> soul, that they had sowed the, the truth about the pagan origin or the pagan roots of Christmas to, you know, in a stony area and it would never take root but to their surprise there was it did take a little root now we don't know where it's going to go maybe it's going to be among thorns maybe it take root root it's going to grow up and that others around there say what do you think you're doing what are you doing that for and then they began the worries of the world well how am i going to you know i mean without christmas how am i going to you know be in the in the black this year You know, I mean, that's my biggest time of year. That's where I make most of my sales. I mean, the devil knows how to, you know, to to get people stuck and tangled in a web. So we don't know where those seeds are going. We we sow the seeds. We have no control over the soil that it lands in. We don't. All we can do is sow the seed or water seed that someone else has sown. That's all. Like Paul said, I sowed Apollos water. And that's all we can do. We can't do anything more than that. But ultimately, there are two choices. Be with God or be separate from God. There are people that they don't want God in their life. They don't want God in their life. They want God. They don't want you to tell them about the Bible or about whatever God says or His standard. They don't want to hear it. They don't want you to tell them about it. That tells you they don't want God. Now, they don't want God because they're not going to read it for themselves either. They could say, well, you know, I appreciate it, but let me read it for myself. How many people ever told you that? Not too many. 
If, if most, most people that have told you, look, and I don't want to hear it, don't talk to me about it, or threw whatever you gave them in the trash, or if you took something to work, put it in the break room, you find it in the trash can, which often happens. Uh, you know, they don't want anyone else to hear it. That's, just a, that's, a, that's the way of the world. So it's not that they just don't want you to share it or they want to find out for themselves. They don't want to hear it at all. And that's the testimony that Jesus said. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. But he goes on to say, but this is the testimony. This is a witness. And the witness is that light has come into the world and people love the darkness. I don't understand it. I really don't understand it. I don't know why you leave the lover of your soul. I don't know why. I don't know how you could be enticed so much by the, the lust of the flesh that you would even think it would enter in your mind to leave the lover of your soul, the one who is giving you eternal life. Now think about this. When you leave God, you leave love. You leave real love. The world is not going to give you love. That woman is not going to give you love. That man is not going to give you that kind of love. It'll never be that kind of love. They'll love you as long as if. I'll love you if. Or well, I'll stay with you if. You know? As long as dot, dot, dot. You know? That's how it is. What does Jesus say? I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. In your darkest hour, I will be there. If you go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will be with you. I'll be there with my rod. I'll be there with my staff. And I will comfort you there. And the, on, on the other side of that, you will have glory forever and ever. Oh, I have good plans for you. I have prepared a place for you. I have a table ready for you, and I'm going to serve you at that table. I'm going to anoint your head with oil, and your cup is going to overflow. And you will live in my house all the days of your life. And the old things will be forgotten, and I'll wipe away every tear. And I've kept all your tears. I have them in a bottle. Your name on it. They're not shed in vain. For every, every one, there's an eternal weight of glory. For every grief, every suffering, there's an eternal weight of glory. Don't lose your faith. Don't ever lose your faith in him. You can, listen, if you or me, if we, if we lose everything that we have, if every single person we know and love walks away from us, stay with Jesus. Stay with him. If you follow them, you only go away from him. Because in reality, they've not only left you, they've left him. Most of the time they leave you because his presence dwells in you. So there's only two choices. Let's go over to first to uh, first John chapter four. You know, I remember one time it was at the Christian concert that the Lord let me experience his grief for people who had walked away. And one of them, particularly, was a couple that he, he actually put a name to or a reference to. One of them was the young rich ruler. You see, the young rich ruler went away sad, but he wasn't the only one that went away sad. The Lord went away sad too. Now the young rich ruler went away sad because he didn't want to give up what he had 
to receive what the Lord would give him. He loved this world more than he loved the world to come. He, he loved his present riches more and his present state as a rich young ruler. Now, he wanted to be told that he could be perfect and follow Jesus and stay a young, rich ruler and ignore those who are in need. But Jesus said, no, if you, if you want to be perfect, go sell all you have, give it to the poor, and then you come and you follow me. You be my disciple. He didn't want to give up the things of this world. But he wanted to think that he could be righteous before God. He wanted to think that he could keep the things of this world, still live a good life. I've done all these things. I, I've kept the commandments my whole life. I've done all these. But the Lord knew he wasn't perfect. The Lord knew that his heart was not wholly his. The Lord knew that he didn't have the true love of God in him, that he had a worldly love and a worldly pride. And the truth is he probably wanted to feel even better about himself. He felt pretty good about himself. I've done these things my whole life. Since I was a youth, I've obeyed God. And, the, you know, but the Lord just said, listen, there's no in between. He who is not with me is against me. Now, he didn't say that there, but that's what he meant. That's what he said in another place. That's the truth of it. He who is not with me is against me. Now, you, if anything is going to stand between you and me, if all those riches are going to stand between me, you and me, your position as a ruler, if that's going to stand between you and I, well, then you're against me. That's what he's saying. Now, that's what Jesus said. He who is not with me is against me. And people out here, they seem to think that somehow they can not be all the way against. They can do what they want, kind of dabble in the world. They can just not really seek God's whole counsel, his full purpose of his will, but that they can still slip into the kingdom of heaven. You're already separating yourself from God. You're already removing yourself from God. You're already moving in another direction with God in your rearview mirror. That's what's already happening. Now, what makes you think that suddenly anything's going to turn around unless you turn around? Unless you turn around and repent. Do you think the Lord's going to run all the way around you, go up in front, says, you know, here, I'll just walk with you. That's not happening. You turn around and you go back and walk with the Lord. That's the only way. The way you're going, he knows where that goes. He knows. He doesn't want you to go there. And the Lord and the Spirit of God in you will never comfort anyone on their way to hell. Nobody. On their way to separation from God, it'll never happen. That's the same Spirit. The Spirit of Jesus Christ. He wouldn't do it. That young rich ruler, he went away sad. It wasn't what he wanted to hear. He wanted to hear Jesus said, well, yeah, I'm glad. You're a good man. You have eternal life. And listen, you have eternal life. You kept all the commandments. You have eternal life. You're a good man. You're faithful and true. But that's not what Jesus said. And the young rich ruler went away sad because it wasn't what he wanted to hear. He didn't get what he wanted from the Lord. But you know who else went away sad? Who was grieved in his heart? That was Jesus. And I know Jesus was more sad because Jesus knew what could have been. Jesus knew what plans he had for that young man. He knew what that young man traded in, what he lost by trading trading what he, you know, the, the riches of glory to come for the things of this world. He knew. So there's only two choices. And people are making their choices today. They're either seeking the Lord and His will to obey Him according to His word, not according to human philosophy or anything else, but according to His word. 
They're yielding themselves, you know, just like the Bible says. They're yielding themselves not only to God, but also to faithful overseers who are watching over their souls. People leave pastures because they don't want anyone watching over their soul. They want to watch over their own soul, although they're not watching over their soul. But see, it's like sheep out there in the pasture without a shepherd. You know, no one would do that. No one would leave them out there without a shepherd because they need to be led and fed properly and protected. And a true shepherd loves. He loves his sheep. He lo- or whoever's sheep that he's attending. Usually it's someone else's sheep. Here, but you know, when you think about love, love is sacrificial. Love is long-suffering. And, it, and love does not consider a wrong uh, suffered either. Here in 1 John chapter 4, notice verse 7. John said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So who is it that knows God? Now this is a theme. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 too, that the Lord knows who loves him. How does he know if you love him? Jesus said, how is it that you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Jesus said in in John chapter 14, uh, or maybe 13, I think it's 13, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It's the last Passover. It's simple. He knows if you love him because you, you obey him. You keep his commandments. You do what he says. That's how we know. Beloved, let us not love one another. Let us love one another, for love is from God. Love is from God. True love is from God. Now, there's a false love or a worldly love, but that's not God's love. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Now, as I was mentioned earlier, there are people who, uh, in every congregation they leave, Uh, But, you know, here's the thing. People here, if someone leaves, it's because they've decided to do something wrong. Most of the time. Now, sometimes they can just be in a situation where they feel like they're unworthy. That happens. You know, we've had people that give testimony of that where, they felt like they didn't belong, that they were unworthy and, and things like that. But that's because they're around committed people. You people are committed. Your level of commitment far exceeds what you'll see out here <clears throat> in most of the churches. You, and I know that. Now out here in these churches, they have people leave too, but they also have a lot of people that stay and just practice sin while they're there. How many pastors do you think there may be around here that are, that are having affairs that the congregation and maybe their wives don't even know about? I mean, it comes out every so often, but they're up there behind the pulpit preaching. They're still counseling, doing marriage counseling to couples. They're doing, you know, leading uh, uh revivals or whatever else, youth groups into things or whatever they're teaching seminars or whatever it happens to be while they themselves are practicing sin. We see it all the time. And then you have that among the members too. They can feel okay. They can go to church because it's not a hot enough environment. You see what I mean? There's not enough conviction there. And they still, of course, like Brother Joseph used to say, uh, church is like a bus stop. You always see different people on the bench, (laughs) you know. So I know that happens. But many are called, but few are chosen. And you think about what Matthew was saying in his sermon then. Many are called. People don't answer the call. But those who, who are called who don't answer the call, 
Then what happens is, is Jesus says, well, I'm, my banquet is going to be filled. So he goes out and he tells them to choose people. So he sends people out specifically say, you come, you come, you come, you come, you come. Now those people are chosen. All everybody else was called. But they didn't show up. They all had various excuses. But he's going to fill it. And if you lay down your crown, your Lord will grieve. Your Father will grieve. You'll hurt his heart. But he'll pick it up and he'll give it to somebody else. He'll go out to the hedges and he'll find someone who will wear it. So, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And by this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we may live through him. When you walk away from God, you're walking away from what he is. He is love. He is the life. He is the eternal life. He is the truth. When you walk away from God, you walk away from the truth. You walk away from life. In, in this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the pro, propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has seen God, that's talking about the Father, at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And we know that love is identified by John. Matter of fact, we could just turn over a page to, verse, uh, to 2 John, verse 6. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is a commandment just as you have heard from the beginning that you should walk in it. Now, there are a lot of people, uh, they, don't check, they don't check to see if they're living according to the commandments of God. The reason we're here on the Sabbath day is because it's the fourth commandment. That's why we're here. We're here because God said, remember the seventh day, the Sabbath day, to keep it holy because God made all things in the first six days, and he rested on the seventh day. Now, God did not say, keep one day in seven. He didn't say, set aside one day. He said, remember the Sabbath day. The, remember the day that I rested. God did not rest on the first day. He worked on the first day. God rested on the seventh day. So if you're going to obey the commandments, you will keep the fourth commandment. I don't know why you want to make a case for keeping any of the other commandments or say, well, I wouldn't have an idol. Or I'm not going to take God's name in vain. Or I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to have hate in my heart. I'm not going to steal. Does it really matter where you break God's law. If Satan can get you to break God's law, you're a transgressor of the law. James said that. He said, if you break one, you've broken the others because it's the same person who gave both laws, you see. So the same person, the same God, the same creator who said, don't, don't have any graven idols, don't take God's name in vain. Don't lie, don't steal. It's the same one that says, remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. You shall have a holy convocation, that's an assembly, on the Sabbath. And then in Hebrews chapter 4, it says don't, or chapter 10, it says don't forsake the assembly, as is a habit of some. Well, we already know when the assembly is to be. Now, people will make all kinds of excuses. They'll try to say, well, it doesn't matter what day. Well, have services every day if you want to. Just don't neglect the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day you're, not to, re you're to rest and not do any servile work, and you're supposed to have a holy convocation. If you want to have services every day like we do when we have tent crusades, 
oh, that's fine. Do it. But don't use the, the idea that, hey, we can have church every day as an excuse to break the Sabbath. Because that's dishonest. And that's not loving God. And that's not obeying His commandment. Again, His commandment is not keep one day because you need it. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Because in six days the Lord your God made heaven and earth and all that's in it, and He rested on that day. And Hebrews 4 says that when we keep the Sabbath, we enter into the Lord's rest. You can't keep Sunday and enter into the Lord's rest because he didn't rest on Sunday. He worked on Sunday. The only day you can enter into the Lord's rest is the seventh day because that's the day he rested. Amen. Now let's go over to uh, uh, John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We'll begin at verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why did he do it? Because he loved us. He gave. He loved us with a love so great that he gave his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son in order that whoever would believe in him should not perish, but that they would have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He's coming to judge when he comes again. But he didn't come to judge the first time. He came to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not judged. And he who does not believe has been judged already. Now, how do you know if you believe? If you believe, you act upon that belief. Amen? You do. If, if someone said there's a bomb threat, uh, you know, we got a call and someone says there's a bomb threat in this building. If you believe that, you will exit the building. You'll act upon that belief. You know, I mean, uh, we do so many things. Most of the things we do is because we believe. You see? When you get in your car and you turn the key, you believe it's going to start. may not always do it, but you believe it is going to happen. I mean, if you, if, if you had a car out in your yard didn't have a motor or didn't have a battery in it, you would go out there and put the key in it. Try, you would not expect it. You would believe that it would start. If you happened to do it and it did, you'd say, that's a miracle from God. <laughs> Amen. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now notice verse 19. This is the judgment that light has come into the world. So there is judgment. Jesus didn't come to judge, but judgment has come. That the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. Okay, do you see that? Men love the darkness rather than loving the light. Rather than loving Jesus, they love the darkness. Now, why do they love the darkness? Because they like their dark deeds. Amen? That's why. They liked fulfilling the lust of their flesh. That's why. They did not want, they wanted to be autonomous over their own life. This is the judgment that light has come into the world and men love the darkness. They love the darkness. You ever see people who, uh, you know, they try to make everything foggy. Nothing is quite right. Nothing is quite wrong. Uh, you know, if they're doing something they shouldn't be doing, then they try to make it really hazy to where it's not really wrong. I had... Uh, 
the opportunity, the privilege to marry my first cousin uh, this week. Uh, and I thought he had already gotten married. He's been with this woman 25 years. And he called me and he said, I'd like, would you be willing to marry me? And uh, I said, well, I thought you were already married. Yeah. And he said, well, you know, I just, I've been faithful to her. She's been faithful. We've been faithful to one another. And I just didn't see, you know, the need for it. And then he said something that really blessed my heart. And he said, but I guess that's how heathens are made. <laughs> but, you know, fix it in your mind. And I said, <laughs> yes, you're right. And, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting because there's just something going on with the whole family. Because they were, you know, higher education people, uh, liberal and really not believing in God, uh, you know, being at least agnostic. That's all changed. The entire family, five kids, and the parents. And uh, so we're in pretty regular communication now. And it, it, it was, a, a, I like that. So anyway, I said, yeah, I, I would. Now see, if this was someone that, knew, that thought they were a Christian, and they were living together, no way I'd marry him. No, I wouldn't. But he didn't. He knew he wasn't. And so I'm just happy. I'm not going to give him a Christian wedding. But I, I said, yes, I'll do it. So I did Friday or Thursday. Yeah. And, uh, and it, was, it was great because I had an opportunity to witness, tell him, you know, that, that God instituted marriage at the very beginning. Join the first humans, the first man and woman together. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, it was, uh, it was, I could tell that they could feel the gravity of it, that they saw, they, they were able to understand the magnitude, the difference in the civil union and the actual entering a marriage covenant that's ordained by God. I mean, it was completely different. I could tell, you know. And the significance, the the the, symbol, the the you know what the ring symbolics is just wedding with you know uh, with putting the ring on each other's with this ring I thee wed, and it being just an endless circle, you know no beginning no end, and which is just symbolic of our eternal devotion and faithfulness to one another. Yeah, it was good. So keep them in your prayers. But, you know, for a long time, it had been kind of in that land of shifting shadows with him. You know, he just didn't see a need. He was thinking with his... And, you know, naturally, you don't. If you just think with your own mind, of course you don't. Thinking with your own mind, you don't think, why? what difference does it make what, what day we go to church? What difference does it make? Yeah, with our own mind... And we, we, that just keeps going. What difference does it make if we keep some, you know, Christmas? What difference does it make if it has pagan origins? We're not doing it for that reason. That's the argument all of them make. There's no end to that. There'll always be a what difference does it make. And what it will come down to, well, in my heart, in my heart, yeah, but if you don't know my heart, in my heart, and I'd say, yeah, you don't know your heart either because <laughs> it's desperately wicked and sick. You know, that's what you don't know. One thing I know, I know your heart better than you do because <laughs> it's just like mine. It's just desperately wicked, except, you know, the heart that Christ has given us in the spirit, man. So it says, this is the judgment that light is coming into the world and men love the darkness. Why? Rather than loving the light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and it's, it's hate or love, and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth, he comes to the light. And that, that's, we know that. 
so that his deeds may be manifest as having been wrought in God. Now, let's go over to Colossians chapter 4. You know, I've mentioned before, uh, you know, when Paul, his last letter to Timothy, how he's saying, all of Asia has left me. And he said, Demas, having loved this present world, you see, now why would you love this present world? It's because now your deeds have become darkness. You don't love. You love the darkness, like Jesus said, John chapter 3, rather than the light. Now that means you love the darkness. When you love the darkness, you're putting your love in the prince of darkness rather than the light which is Jesus, rather than loving the light. And the reason why you love the prince of darkness and darkness is because you love your fleshly evil deeds. That's it. You don't want to stop practicing sin. You don't want anyone to show you where you're in sin. Because you don't want to think that you love darkness, even though Jesus said you do. You want to think that it's all relative. And that there are so many gray areas. And that God is, I'm going, God is not going to condemn me. Listen, God knows your heart. God knows you're not even seeking God. God knows you're not even seeking his will. When's the last time he heard the prayer for his will? Come on. When's the last time? I mean, if you honestly talk to some of these people, when's the last time you actually asked God to lead you into the truth? To lead you into light? To show you where you may be wrong? To convict your heart of your sin, secret or not? Well, they don't. Because they're not interested in that. They're interested in not being, you know, they don't want to feel bad. They don't want their conscience to hurt them. But we talk about Demas. But before that, here in Colossians chapter uh, 4, notice verse 14. Well, verse 13. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you. He's talking about Epaphras, our beloved brother. And he says, I want to tell you, he's laboring earnestly for you in his prayers. And that you may stand, notice, perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. You see, that's what his prayer was. It's for the will of God. That's verse 12. Well, let's just read verse 12. Epaphras, who is, now this is his end, ending of his letter. You know, he's telling the Colossians. Now, Epaphras, who is, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, he sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers. He's laboring in prayer. We don't labor enough in prayer. I mean, the example here, I mean, we see this in laboring in prayer, going into that secret place. Now, I'm talking to myself too. We don't labor enough in prayer. We need to. We would see a, many more victories quicker if we labored in prayer. If we're interceded for one another as Christ intercedes for us. He labors constantly in prayer for us, interceding for us. But he's saying, I want you to know brethren and you brethren in, in Colossae, Epaphras, you know him. He's one in your number. He's, he's in your church. He's a part. He's in the congregations there. Well, he is. He sends you greetings. Because obviously, you know, at this time, he's with Paul. But he's, he came from here. But now he's on the journey with Paul. And he said, you know, he's one of you. He's with me. But he sends you his greetings. And I want you to know he's always laboring earnestly for you in prayers. And this is what he labors, what he prays, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. That's the goal. 
Not in the land of shifting shadows where there's 67 shades of gray. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea at Heropolis. So see, we know what happened to Laodicea later. Poor, blind, and naked, and don't even know it. Do you think that they needed that prayer? That they needed to stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God? Because they weren't, but they thought they were. And then it's verse 14, it says, Luke, the beloved physician, he sends you his greetings, and also Demas. So Demas is right there with Paul. When it, wherever Paul was when he wrote this letter to the Colossians. Now let's go to Philemon after Titus. Notice verse 23. Well, verse, uh, verse 21. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. At the same time, also prepare me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. So, how is he going to make it there? By his prayers. How are you going to do anything? How are we going to do anything as a church? Through our prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner, in Jesus Christ greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke my fellow workers. So Demas is one of the fellow workers who's with, who is with uh, Paul. Now, you know, here's the thing. Paul wrote a lot of these letters while he was in prison in Rome, which meant that's where these men were. And he was giving them instructions. They were visiting him while he was incarcerated and he was sending them out telling them what to do. He was writing these epistles and giving, to, giving them to them and, and uh, to take to the various churches. And he gave this one and it was sent to Colossae and in that he gave the greetings at the end. Now over in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we already saw where Demas is a beloved co-laborer in the Lord with the Apostle Paul. And here in 1 Timothy chapter Four, we'll begin in verse 1. Paul says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, Timothy. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Make every effort to come to me soon, for Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to, to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. And it's sad, after all the service, and going on these missionary trips with the Apostle Paul, being with the Apostle Paul, hearing Paul preach, how many times a day? And then being mentored by him in between, you know, places. I mean, could Demas have had a better example? Could Demas have been in a better position 
to succeed, to fulfill the will of God. I mean, Demas heard the letters. He heard the letter to Philemon. He heard the letter that Paul wrote. It was written. He had it. He probably read it many times himself. The letter to the Colossians. And yet in all that, he deserted Paul when Paul was in prison. And Paul had to tell Timothy, break the news to Timothy because Timothy was on a mission himself. He was already, Paul had sent him out to Ephesus. So he told him, Demas has deserted me. And he tells why. Because he loved this present world. It's tragic. It's like the young rich ruler. It's like Solomon. You know it all grieved the Lord's heart. Must have broken his heart. Now let's go over to John chapter 13. Anyone who loves God will bear fruit. Here in First John, chapter 13, verse 34. John says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. That you also love one another. Though that's a commandment. It doesn't do any good to keep idols out of your house. It doesn't any, do any good to keep the Sabbath day if you don't have love for one another. And we know what love is, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is not selfish, love doesn't seek its own interests. Love is patient and long-suffering. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. How? As I have loved you. That's a sacrificial love. And that's what I saw in the vision when I saw myself on the cross and I felt the love of God which was foreign to me. Never felt that before. I thought it wasn't me. Well, it wasn't. That was the love of Christ, the love of God. And the Lord, though the voice said, this is how you must be. He was showing me how far short I, I was. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, that's an active love. Chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. That's the only way. Verse 15, this last Passover, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, if we don't keep his commandments, that's love spurned. You're spurning God's love. How do you know? Because love is keeping the commandments. That's what we saw in 2 John. Love is, this is love, that you keep his and that they're not a burden. Verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. That's simple. Now, that's what Jesus said. No one is ever going to be able to stand before the Lord and says, okay, I didn't obey all your commandments. I didn't even try to obey all your commandments. But I love you, Lord. That's just not going to happen. Now, there will be people who don't know. There's a lot of people lived and died, for example, that don't know that Saturday is the Sabbath day. And all their whole life they thought they were keeping the Sabbath when they rested and worshiped on Sunday. Well, the Lord knows that. The Lord knows that. But this is a day of enlightenment. This is a day where with a touch of the, you know, your iPhone or your smartphone, you can look and, and there's a wealth of information there. You can find out the truth about, about, about anything. You may have to sift a little. You may have to search a little because there's a lot of misinformation. But the scripture is plain. The scripture tells us plainly what commandments, what the commandments are 
and uh, how to keep them. So he says, verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me, and the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Verse 20, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. That's a, abide in him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. It's simple, isn't it? But the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. Chapter 15, verse 5. I am the vine, Jesus said, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. And then he tells us how to abide in his love. If you keep my commandments, verse 10, you will abide in my love. Can you keep, can you abide in God's love and not keep his commandments? No, you can't. You can't abide in God's love and on purpose forsake one of his commandments. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love love. You know, like uh, God is not going to, he created us as free moral agents. He can't make you love him. He doesn't make you obey him. You know, it's funny, these people that are always saying, well, why don't God do something about evil? Why does he stop the evil? Well, he's done that. I can think of a few places in the Bible. Like when he destroyed the Canaanites. Because the Canaanites were, for 400 years, had been sending their children, their babies, to Moloch and burning them on that red hot metal statue with their priests beating the drums to. To, dry, you know, to drown out the screams of the dying babies, the burning babies that are burning to death. This happened to thousands and thousands of babies. Sodom and Gomorrah, Tyre and Sidon, wicked, child sacrifice, sodomy, homosexuality, wickedness, immorality of every kind, murder, violence, all these things. So God destroys them. And Richard Dawkins writes in his book, The God Delusion, that he is a mass murderer because of it. And one side of his mouth he'll say, well, if God is good, why don't he do something about stopping the evil? Well, he did. He destroyed them. But before he destroyed them, he sent prophet after prophet after prophet, and they would not repent. Before he destroyed them, because he said, I do nothing without first warning by the prophets. He, knew, he warned Nineveh. We have that example. Nineveh repented. God didn't destroy them because they repented. The Canaanites did not repent. Tyre and Sidon did not repent. Sodom and Gomorrah did not repent. After being repeatedly warned by prophets and then them killing the prophets of God and continuing on in the darkness. So you have a choice. Let this wickedness continue or stop it. Now, if I had my gun and I saw a mass murderer, I go to a school and I saw a mass murderer and he's shooting children, I'm shooting him. I won't think twice about it. I won't hesitate about it. Because I will stop that uh, murder. 
I'll stop it. And if I don't stop it, you know who's going to stop it? A policeman or somebody with a gun is going to come. They're going to get here or there to school or where it happens to be, and they're going to stop the man. You know how they're going to stop him? They're going to shoot him. But they may say, put the gun down first. They may give him an opportunity to stop what he's doing. Then most of the time that happens. Put the gun down. Hold it. Stop. And usually when they don't stop is when they get shot. Same thing with God. You know, these people, they say, why doesn't God do something without about all the evil in the world? Well, what if he started with you? How about that? Why don't we just say, okay, let him start with you because you're wicked too. You know, First John chapter 2. Now verse 15. Now notice this. Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. Now that's something that John tells us. We have control over that. Demas loved this present world. He loved the things of this world. He did not have to. He didn't have to. And how did that happen? We see in John chapter, uh, James chapter 1. Each one, God doesn't tempt us. Each one is tempted when they're enticed by their own lust. The lust is already there. As I've said, in the flesh, in us, something in us that wants to move away from God, gravitate away from God. It's just that way in the flesh. So he says, you have to make it, make up in your mind not to love the world nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You know, people that have left, that's gone into immorality and say it's just natural. It's just the way of the world. Of course it is. But we're not of the world. We're to be lights to the world. To come out of the world. So that you're not partakers of the judgment that's coming upon the world. You know, Lot came out of Sodom. If he had not come out of Sodom, he would have died. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they were not all of us. Now, I really don't take that to mean that they were never, like, for example, that Demas was never converted. I don't think it can mean that. Uh, that happens. People, you know, are not really converted. They're there, but they, they're not really converted. They never really received the Holy Spirit, never really were broken and gave their heart to the Lord. That happens, and that happens a lot, especially out here in the world. Uh, but this also is like, you know, you can... It can apply to someone like Cain. Well, Cain had a choice. I think Demas had a choice. Demas loved this present world. Now, what did John say? John says, don't love this present world. Well, do you think maybe Demas had a chance, a choice to make, whether to allow the devil to entice him with the love of this world or not? And I think he did. Because God doesn't want anyone to perish, amen? It's not his desire. Chapter 4, notice verse 7. Well, we already read that. Uh, so let's go over to 2 Peter. We'll end with 2 Peter, chapter 3. Verse 
And then we'll have Michael close us in prayer. Second Peter chapter three, we're beginning verse. One, this is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking following after their own lusts, and that's what happens. Why do they do this? Why do they mock God? Because they have lust in their heart. They they don't want to be accountable to God. They have lust in their heart, you see. Uh, You know, think about it. Have you ever thrown anything away? Have you ever had a, a favorite purse? And you love that purse, but it just wore out. And it really got to be where it wasn't good for anything. So what did you do with it? It was no longer useful for you, so you threw it away. It could be a pair of shoes. Man, I love these shoes. But eventually they wore out. Well, what do you do with them when they're no longer useful? Or maybe you have a computer and it becomes broken. You take it out to Staples and they say, this computer cannot be fixed. You're going to have to have a new computer. Well, what do you do with it? You don't build a monument to it. You throw it away, you see. And why? Because it will no longer do what it was designed to do, what it was created to do. Well, we're created by God. And these people think that somehow, well, then why is it that I have to go to be with God or be separate from God? Why why do I have to go to hell? Why do I have to live separate from God? You know, I don't want to be with God but I want to do what I want to do and go where I want to go. Well, there's two choices. With God, separate from God. That's all there is. But also, when it it comes down to it, God's not going to force you. He's not going to force you to love Him. He's not going to force you to come draw near to Him. He's there with open arms. He's calling you. He loves you. But He's not going to force you. If, you know, if you, if you want to go the way of the world, you can go the way of the world. But the way of the world goes to separation from God and ultimately to hell. That's where it goes. There's, that's it. It goes to eternal death. And that's all there is. One's eternal life, one's eternal death. That's it. And so there's people, I mean, they, they think that somehow that they created themselves, they own themselves. Well, you didn't create yourself. You have a creator. You don't own yourself. You don't own the breath that you're breathing. You don't even have the, the only reason you have life and a conscience to begin with is because God has given it to you. But you don't have eternal life. It's a gift from God. He will give you eternal life. He will give you something you do not have. God's gift is eternal life, Romans 6, 23. So people mock. You know, they, they, they want to, to, as if the world is not going to be here. This world is going to be vaporized. It's going to be burned up. It's going to be gone. You're not going to inherit this world forever. Or people say, well, why can't I just go on, do what I want to do? Well, <laughs> that's because there's a plan that God has. And in his plan, this world is going to be burned up and he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. For those who want to be with him, who want to be with the Lord. Those who don't want to be with the Lord, they don't have to be. They can just die. But there will be nowhere for them to live. And saying, where is the promise? These mockers, they'll say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. That means people who don't want to be with God. That's all that is. 
Do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. In other words, turn around, don't go away from me, come back to me. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hasting the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for this calling that you have given us. Lord, we pray that we would honor it as we should. And we're just so blessed to have, again, this appointment with you and to have your word and to be able to put our faith and our trust in what it is that you have made so clear and how you have this great love for us and that you have set us apart and you are carefully leading us if we are careful to listen. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for the, just the access that we have to be in your spirit and to have that fellowship with you and with each other. And Lord, I pray that you would continue with us it, as was prayed earlier that and all that we do and, and say and act and as we think in our in our hearts and our minds, Lord, that it would be to to honor you. We thank you so much for the way that you provide for us. Thank you for this meal. Just ask your blessing on it and on the hands that prepared it, Lord, and and on the rest of this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 